Hi, Dr. Julie here at Vitagene. We have a very special guest today, Dr. Reza Malik. He is an endovascular neurosurgeon, and we're to, today we're going to be talking about MTHFR and some of the myths out there, and really seeing how this impacts patients in a clinical setting. So we're gonna bring in another doctor where that impacts his work life as well, and we'll get going with some questions. So Dr. Malik, what kind of issues come up in your clinic um, regarding MTHFR or homocysteine or any of those kind of questions regarding this genetic area that there's been so much confusion about? Sure, um, thanks Dr. Chen. Um, glad to be here because I would love to ask you a lot of questions about you know, integrative medicine, about supplements, especially MTHFR, which there's a lot of discussions on it. You look at internet, YouTube, there's so much videos about every direction, people talking about how dangerous this is and you know, you're gonna die or it's something horrible is gonna happen to you. So I do endovascular neurosurgery, I do stroke procedures, one of the busiest stroke programs in the country. And a lot of my patients come back and ask me, how about MTHFR or should I be supplementing with folic acid and they think and a lot of them are taking folic acid and uh, they should be taking folic acid and if they don't check their genes or they don't take enough folic acid they're gonna have a horrible stroke they're gonna have another stroke so my understanding from you know back medical school genetics all that is you know you have the DNA it gets translated and then a protein from RNA to the protein and if you have the MTHFR gene variation you may not have the protein that is as active or works as well. But do all my patients need to take folic acid? Which ones should be taking folic acid? That's a great question. So when Dr. Malik was talking about the protein, he's talking about the MTHFR enzyme protein. And what that enzyme does is that it helps to convert the inactive form folic acid into folate, and then it helps to then folate in the active form, helps to lower and convert homocysteine so it doesn't accumulate and become too high and then become inflammatory, which then puts our patients at risk for cardiovascular issues, which includes things like strokes. So regarding folic acid supplementation or folate supplementation, what's interesting is, is that um, heterozygous, which is when you have only one of the gene variations, so it's not both genes. So the functionality is a little bit better than if they were homozygous, but at the same time, it is affected. When heterozygous MTHFR is actually very common. And so when that happens in the majority of the population out there, we then worry about as clinicians whether there are stroke risks or heart attack risks. And when patients are supplementing with folic acid, it is the wrong kind of folic acid or folate they should be taking. So folic acid then, if you have the variation, gene variation, you can't convert very well. So if you're going to take supplementation, it would be in the form of methylfolate, which is more the active form. Having said that, nowadays because the food is so well fortified, and also if you're someone who eats relatively well and you eat foods like spinach, broccoli, beans, you're able to get the active end form already and you're not dependent on the conversion issue. So you don't need the MTHR gene at all? In the sense that you're already getting the product that you need to lower the homocysteine because at the end of the day, we're concerned about that homocysteine and inflammation. Okay. So when you also then overdose on supplementation and you're over supplementing yourself without even checking lab levels, you're then putting yourself at risk for overdosing and toxicity of the vitamins because there are studies that demonstrate that when you overdo B vitamins, including things like folic acid or folate, you are at higher risk for potential associations with cancers. So the important thing to do is to actually check lab levels. Intracellular folate, have your doctors check RBC folate, check your B vitamin levels, B12, check your homocysteine levels. There's also another lab called methylmalonic acid so that you can see if it's actually helping to get into working with that homocysteine and not just building up the B vitamins without helping it. And then there's other factors that do actually elevate homocysteine separate from the B vitamins, like when your body's inflamed from eating a lot of sugars, um, if your body's inflamed from other diseases. So you wanna be checking labs like hemoglobin A1C to look at your sugar, fasting glucose, and then you also wanna be checking labs like sedimentation rates or, L or your C-reactive protein, and just see how does your inflammation as a whole look for the patient. So if you're worried about like stroke risks, you wanna look at the person globally and then talk to them about their diet. And then once you figure out what's going on in their diet, you can easily allay their fears by saying, well, you're, I see that you're not getting enough vegetables, potentially eat more vegetables, and then that way we naturally 
will lower your risks with a stroke and heart attack issues that you're concerned about. So uh, it's very interesting because so what you're saying is actually people are doing harm, a lot of people are doing harm by taking too much folic acid. Yes, and that's the thing is, is that it, when you supplement, you want to be supplementing with a goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So you have to get a lab to see where your baseline is. And if you're already fine there, you know, our bodies are like the, the bear that has to get it just right. Too much or too little, it's issue, there's going to be issues. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting, for example, is B6 toxicity can occur with too much B6, but the symptoms of B6 toxicity is same as someone with B6 deficiency. So you want to make sure when you're supplementing that you're getting the right level. And if you're already getting enough in food, you do not need to supplement above and beyond that. Perfect. I think that's all the time we have today. And thank you so much for joining thank us. For and we will probably really want to get back into this because this has been very interesting to see how it impacts people clinically out in the real world. And if you have more questions and we, you want to learn more about this because we want to help you achieve the optimal health that you're trying to get to, contact us at support at